Hello and welcome to the next podcast. This is Mark Bruno, the Managing Director of the Wealth Management Group at Informa Connect. And we are very, very excited for this episode of the next podcast, where we will go into detail looking at what we think the wealth management firm of the future will look like. And I cannot think of anyone better to talk about the future of wealth management than our guest, Andrew Altfest, who is the president of Altfest Personal Wealth Management and also the founder of FP Alpha, uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail. So, Andrew, thank you so much for being here today. We're looking forward to doing a deep dive into the future of wealth with you. Super excited to be here with you, Mark. I think uh, we've always connected well. We're both uh, New York guys. I like your research. Uh, I've followed it for a long time. So keep up the good work. And I'm, I think it should be a fun conversation. Same here. And appreciate anybody who appreciates, appreciates our research. You never know when you work on some of these projects for months at a time, right? If people will actually read them. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. Speaking of research, we had the opportunity not long ago to get together at the Wealth Management Edge conference. We had hosted an RIA Edge think tank, which will support you know, this project, right? And there were a lot of great ideas that came out of that discussion. Um, where you know, we'll be using some of the themes, some of the topics to not only inform you know, interviews for the next podcast, but we will be producing a next wealth management firm of the future research project that will get into a lot of detail on technology, human capital, growth opportunities, you name it. Um, but yeah, there were a number of things that came out of that think tank that I wanted to make sure we reconnected on. But before we go into detail on some of those specific themes, Andrew, I know a lot of people are probably familiar with Altfest. Um, probably familiar with FP Alpha, but I think it would be a really helpful starting point if you were able to give a little bit of context on both hats that you wear. You have such a unique role as an advisor, but also somebody who's building a technology company. Um, so if you wouldn't mind just a little bit of background and over overview of the two roles that you play at both firms, that'd be a great place to start. Yeah, sure. Um, so I am president of Altfest Personal Wealth Management. That's a larger RIA in Midtown Manhattan. Uh, we manage about $1.6 billion for high net worth individuals. And it's a, it's a very well-established uh, wealth management firm uh, started in the early 80s by my father, Lou Altfest, my mother, Karen Altfest, uh, joined the business several years later and uh, grew it significantly. I joined uh, as an advisor 18 years ago. So I have been working at next as a, I would, I think you could say a next gen advisor looking to accelerate uh, the growth, build on the, the legacy that, that my parents established as uh, early pioneers in the RA world as uh, my father's a Schwab impact award winner, Barron's hall of fame member, founding member of NAFA. And a few years ago, uh, uh, a little over two years ago, to be specific, I founded a software company called FP Alpha, and that software company uses AI to allow advisors to take their clients' financial documents, wills, trusts, tax returns, insurance policies, upload them. FP Alpha uses AI to read those documents, summarize those documents, and find gaps and opportunities in 16 areas of planning. Uh, giving those opportunities back to advisors to share with their clients. And we're completely complementary to the retirement planning tools out there. We weren't passionate about trying to build a slightly better version of what existed. We thought what existed did a good enough job. But all the other areas in advanced planning that clients are asking for, like estate and tax insurance, that's, that's what we solve for very easily. So yeah, a lot of fun stuff going on. And uh, hopefully I can, I can share some good ideas uh, for uh, everyone who's listening. I appreciate that. No, one of the reasons that we wanted to have you on as one of the very first guests was, you know, this unique perspective that you have sitting, you know, inside of a very large, very successful RIA firm, right? Um, but also starting FP Alpha a couple of years ago. Um, and it's not too dissimilar in the early stages. I think of you know, people like Greg Friedman, right? Who started Private Ocean, uh, started mm -hmm. Juncture. Um, there are not a lot of advisors who have also obviously created their own technology companies, but the lens that you have, right, can tell our audience a lot about, you know, one, where there are potentially pain points within an advisory firm, but two, how you could solve for them to create, whether it's, you know, more growth opportunities or a better client experience or both. Um, so I guess the simple question is, what made you start FP Alpha? Yeah, uh, I appreciate you mentioning Greg Friedman. I, I had a uh, pleasure catching up with him um, at Edge just a, a few weeks ago. And, you know, what, 
it, it came from is, is it came out of a pain point that I had uh, as an advisor. So I think that, that that's the opportunity today. I think the, the, the opportunity is, is that as advisors, we know what we need. Uh, we know what's missing and we have a, you, you know, the more that you, you network that I connect with other people within the tech industry, it's tough to, to understand what advisors want from the, the outside looking in. And what I was finding is, is that we had these really good tools on the retirement planning side, but clients were asking us for help with many more areas of planning. At the same time, looking out down the road, five years out, 10 years out, looking at where we wanted to, to take our firm, where, where, I thought, where I saw the industry going, and with a comp- increasing competition on the investment side from robos and others, I wanted to, to drive full financial wellness for our clients. And so, yeah, it's one thing to manage their portfolio. It's another thing to, to be um, helping them with their retirement planning needs, uh, helping them understand how much money they can afford to spend in retirement without going broke. But to help them actually understand their estate planning, to understand how it could, where they are today and how it can be improved, uh, mm-hmm. how to reduce their taxes, where the risks are in their, in their insurance coverage, where the opportunities are to reduce costs, uh, and so on and so forth. That work, I started to actually um, embark on developing processes in these areas for our wealth management firm. And I literally started to build checklists and I... It, just in estate planning, get this, just in estate planning, I built a 50 page checklist and uh, working with attorneys. And I was having our team read our clients' legal documents, which, which not only is it incredibly time consuming, it isn't fun. Um, it's, it's probably the, one of the, the least uh, fun things you can, you can, you could set out to do. Even, even the, the people, the attorneys doing this work um, are, are, are not looking for, um, are, are not em- embracing this. So, Basically, I didn't understand why there was this was a manual process, why I had to develop processes in all of these areas, why we were reading documents. And I could also see that there was no way that we we're going to be able to, to scale this. So uh, how do you go to a, a, a team of, of advisors that are already busy with many? I mean, the, the, the world of an advisor is, is it's not easy. I mean, we have requests coming in. We have we, we have work that we set out to do. Then the let's say the market goes down and then we have clients calling about their portfolios. It's, it's a demanding job. And, you know, to actually say, you know, now we're going to go and, and embark on doing estate reviews, and insurance reviews, tax reviews. There's just not, it, it wasn't going to happen. It was going, you know, maybe for first, you know, a couple of wealthy clients, but, but, but not for anyone else. So I just didn't understand why, in this day and age where we have advanced technology, I'm reading articles and McKinsey articles about AI and driverless cars, why we were literally having to uh, reinvent the wheel at Altfest. So I started to network within the tech community and ultimately I connected with our CTO who has a background in AI development. And that's when we started to build an early version of FP Alpha, just focused initially on tax. And that was uh, going back to to 2017, 2018 was the first year we had it in, in use at, at Altfest. And, you know, I, I was very pleasantly surprised by all what uh, all the possibilities that, that exist. Uh, I, I do think that we have the technology today. I just don't think it's being applied. If you ask advisors, are they using AI? And, and, and I'm speaking now across the country and so I'll, I'll ask at an event and I'll say, are you using AI? Are you using it at all? Are you using it in a meaningful way? And the answer is always no. And so the, the, the technology is there. It just hasn't been applied to our industry where no one's going to no accuse the, the advisor industry of being uh, ahead of the curve and when yeah. it comes to, to technology and, and technology and, and in terms of innovations, uh, specifically for advisors. It's a little better. You know, there's, there, there are a couple of things that, that come out for consumers every every half a dozen years that are, that are more innovative and, and, and the advisor industry will, will try to uh, adopt that technology. But in terms of, of using AI and it, it's just not happening. And, and, and so I said, look, we need this, but at the same time, I think the whole industry needs it. I, and 
you know, as I was networking, connecting with with friends and uh, in the industry, and asking them about you know their pain points, they were they were saying, I mean, I hate that I hate the actual gathering of the the information to create the plan. I hate and and you know I I and and they were giving specific pain points about the tools they had today, and and then and I was like, okay, you can you have this tool, you have a you know your your financial planning software has this problem. I was like, well, well what about this? What, if, what happens if we were to get rid of the information gathering and you could take a, a will and upload it and it could tell you FP alpha, the software can tell you what's wrong with it. That's, that's financial planning 2.0. I would use that in a yep. second. So I, I think it's, I think the, it was a, a combination of, of a pain point that I had the vision of, of the industry where I think we're going to drive to be more like the physicians of finance to drive total wellness for individuals in our industry, particularly as we have more competition these days from uh, on the investment side. And I think we just all feel good about it too. Yeah. And I think you, you touched on you know, a couple of points there that I want to come back to. And I'm glad that you did. Um, the first one was just this idea of bringing something, uh, bringing a better experience into you know the financial advice you know, space, right? From a technology perspective, you look at in my daily life, what my experience as a consumer, you know, with consumer brands is like, whether it's on my phone or computer, and it is night and day, right? Um, often you can go to a wealth management company's website and it's really just a brochure. Um, there's not a lot of functionality. It doesn't facilitate anything. It's a very, very different experience, right? Um, so I'm glad to hear it started with you looking at a problem and saying, it, it doesn't have to be this way <laughs> in this industry, right? And I, I think that there are a lot of really smart people who are you know, thinking in a similar way and are really starting to drive some change. The second part of it is, you, know, you mentioned that you speak at a lot of different conferences and you ask who's using AI and you don't see a lot of hands go up. I think you know what you're doing that's really important is you're not just talking about AI, right? Um, you're actually talking about the application of AI within their day-to-day -day business and you know, their day-to-day -day workflows. Um, and I remember, you know, for years, you just heard artificial intelligence, you have big data thrown around and they were obviously buzz terms, but you talk to an advisor and they would say like, yeah, I don't know what to do with big data, right? We were never really <laughs> defining the business case. I actually remember being at a conference talking about Netflix when they first started to blow up and saying, you know, Netflix uses big data by looking at what are some of the most popular shows on our platform. And at the time it was House of Cards, which was just in the UK. And they noticed that people who were watching House of Cards were also huge Kevin State State uh, Kevin Kevin Spacey fans, excuse me. Um, so they cast him to be in the U.S. version of it, and that's how they started to introduce big data, right? And at that moment, I saw more advisors sort of nodding and saying, "All right, we we kind of get it." On the AI side, I mean, can you tell me a little bit about how it may have improved outcomes for you at Altfest, right, as a firm and as an advisor? or for some of the firms you know, that you're working with directly who are looking to solve for a very similar problem? Yeah, and I, you know, I think your, your AI experience is, is very relevant because basically AI is, is it's a buzzword and I, I don't think, you don't, people don't buy AI. I mean, they buy business outcomes and AI is a, a tool to get to uh, certain outcomes. Let's say it's saving time, or let's say it's um, doing more for clients while not having to invest much more time in the relationship, or it's 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 the ability to um, you know offer a, a more well-rounded suite of services, and that leads to additional pricing power with clients. I mean, th these are all uh, we. I think we we have to be very careful in our industry to to make sure that we're investing in, in outcomes. And that's where, that's what advisors want. I mean, they, uh, who, who doesn't want that? Uh, you know, we're, who, we're all paying the, the bills and we want to make sure that, that we're getting stuff out of technology, not just investing in some um, cool, nice to have thing that's making predictions that are not, you know, doing much. Uh, so I, I think in, in terms of the, the AI and, and how it's, how it's working for us, I mean, we have, you can have 10, 20, 30 documents written by as many attorneys, and they could be expressing the same thing, but in different ways. So you have to be able to 
uh, you can use AI in a way in a way that's that's similar to how AI is used by Siri, how AI is used by Alexa, using natural language processing to understand text and understand words that are being written. And so the 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 advisor doesn't need to read that document and have to un- understand that document his or herself, thereby saving the advisor a lot of time. So that, that's a, a primary way that we're using AI, just by uploading legal documents, tax returns, insurance policies. The AI is able to understand what those documents are saying, thereby saving the advisor time. Then, then that information is summarized and combined with algorithms that, uh, that are, are basically you can you could see them as the brains of the the attorneys the accountants the insurance brokers and they're making recommendations so let's say someone is in a is not itemizing their uh, deductions is giving to charity and so they're getting no benefits uh, for the charitable donation well then the the document is uploaded uh, the AI is reading it and then the recommendation is coming to let's say uh, front load a donor advised fund to be able to, to take advantage of, uh, of someone's charitable giving and, and get a greater tax benefit, reduce money. So that's, that's how we're using AI uh, primarily. And it's, and, and so it's a very specific, but, but, but very impactful use case around, around AI. It's a, I'm glad that you offered as much sort of specific detail around that as you did, because you know, I think that's how you bring these types of things in, to life, essentially. And when we talk about the wealth management firm of the future, and not just on this podcast, but in general, I don't know right, that the firm of the future, the most successful firms need to go out and build this in the way that you have. right? But I do know that the firms that are the most successful will probably be the ones that are leveraging technology in the smartest way. Um, I think AI will most likely be a big part of that. And just this application that you've talked through, I think about, and I've seen those documents, the 50, 60 page legal documents, the wills, right? <laughs> and hours of time just decoding, right? And essentially doing like a crossword puzzle or word search, right? <laughs> to get at the relevant data or information you need to put together a plan. Uh, so it's not just time saving, right? But it's the intelligence. So congrats to you and what you've created. At FP Alpha, and congrats on just a rate on raising some more awareness around the specific applications and use cases for AI in the wealth space. I definitely see you know a lot of good things ahead for you and your team there. Um, I do just as we talk about the future, I want to touch on a couple of the data points that came out of uh, the next survey that we do. We talked about this at the think tank, and we saw that you know, I think it was about you know the average firm that we surveyed grew their, their assets under management by about hundred percent over the last five years and expects to grow by another 100% over the next five years, right? Typical RIA has doubled and expects that they will double again, right? Uh, It's a pretty amazing growth opportunity and set of growth expectations if you think about it. As you step back and you look at growth opportunities in the industry more broadly, the firms that are the most successful in accelerating their growth, right? What do you think some of their core characteristics will be? Yeah, I, I I think that first we have to to think about what has worked in the past, and then think about what we think what we feel is going to work in the future. And and so I'll for 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 better or worse, I'll tell you about what we're doing at Allpest that's leading to a lot of success. The the way I see it is that our industry was developed based on referrals, client referrals, and referrals from other professionals, accountants, and attorneys. And that has been the, the bread and butter. Those who are growing fast, the fastest are doing a better job at building those, those relationships with related yeah. professionals. Not, not easy to do. Yeah. You know, I, I was at the, the Barron's uh, Hall of Fame conference at the end of last year. And there was a, a lot of very successful advisors. Uh, they have great, uh, grown amazing businesses and a lot of it has come from having relationships within very wealthy communities. Um, I think going forward, there's a huge opportunity w- with digital marketing. And I don't, 
I, I think the, the issue, and, and with all due respect with, with uh, benchmarking studies, because I know you, you, you create very good ones, so I read them. I think look, benchmarking against what our peers are doing, it can be dangerous and because it could, it could limit opportunities. And so when I look at how I see the industry evolving, how I see it growing, I, I look outside the industry and I look at how firms are growing within the technology space. Yep. I look at how Salesforce is growing. And it, that's through um, digital marketing, that's through content marketing, and that's and and having specialized people within sales who are building the business and growing the business. And so I, I think that the our industry has been defined by more of a grinder minder finder model. And some people are doing very well at that. And you know, and, and those people are my hats off to them, but I think the, the industry, as it continues to evolve, as some of the founders who enter the industry originally move on to the next chapter in their lives, uh, retire, sell their practices. And then it becomes the, those, those founders who are rainmakers, uh, and there's, there, there needs to be an, another place to look for the growth. And I think that as firms mature, as they professionalize, there's going to be more of a focus on service and more of a focus on, you know, a segmentation between service and sales. And, and the sales is, is increasingly coming from digital marketing. So mm -hmm. what, what we do at Altfest is we use a combination of content marketing targeted to niche audiences and we combine that with influencers to those audiences. And then finally, the last piece is, is the people who are doing the, the, the lead gen are, are full-time salespeople. So when I look forward at a sustainable growth model, I look at it not dependent on, first of all, any one person. I, I look at it as predictable, not you know, who's going to refer, how many client referrals am I going to get this year? Those are important. Don't get me wrong. We're, but I look at something that is, hey, let's 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 go out, target, make things happen, and put put out a lot of content. Have people who are listening to our content, following us. Uh, we've grown our following into the into the many thousands now, and those people who follow us over time, uh, a certain percentage of those uh, become clients, and it's taken us quite a while to, to take us a little while to perfect this. Yeah. Um, I, I don't even think, uh, I, I think perfecting it is, is the wrong word. I don't, word. I don't <laughs> think you ever perfect it because then you just, you keep learning and you keep experimenting. And, but we, to, to actually get to where we are and, and the level of success we, we're having has taken quite some time. And I think that this is, this is the, the greatest opportunity that we have for our industry to be able to grow going forward. And, and look, at, look at the environment now, Mark. I mean, the, the markets are, are down sharply and you have double digit declines in a, in a normal moderate uh, stock bond portfolio this year. This is normally, I, I don't, we'll see how, what, what this year looks like uh, and, and how it uh, shakes out. But what, what, what ends up, what, what usually happens in an environment like this is that people tend to be more stuck. They tend to be shell-shocked. They, they, they tend to, they tend to it, it could be a very good year for, for retention, client retention. But in terms of, of moving around, changing advisors, I, I think this, is, this can be a more difficult environment if it's a, uh, during a, a market decline. But what we're doing is by, we're finding that this is a great time for prospecting yep. through our digital marketing channels because there are a lot of people out there who have invested in the most speculative parts of the market, like technology, like crypto, yeah. like some of these other areas that we know about, and they, they have completely gotten hammered. And now they're, they're reevaluating their plans. Those are the types of people that, that you can connect with today through a, a, a digital marketing strategy because... I, I don't see as many of those people coming in through the, the client referrals, but they're following, they are reading the investment content. They are reading the, they are taking the portfolio consultations. They are, they are new to working with, 
with advisors. And um, these are some of the people that that we're finding who are who are who we're working with uh, right now. And 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 so I, I see I see a tremendous opportunity in front of us by using uh, digital marketing. And and I think that that's ultimately what what some of the the most successful firms in the industry are going to um, are going to be perfecting in one way or the other. Yeah, I think you know nobody's cracked the code yet, but there are a lot of different firms that are doing a lot of different things and are learning and sharing their experiences. And you know, I've seen what you just mentioned: this idea of you know, being able to connect with people right now. You know, given the market environment, I mean, there are a lot of investors that had portfolios, but they didn't have plans, right? And that's where you really do need professional guidance and advice, right? Um, so it does seem like there are a lot of people who have been do-it-yourself investors looking for advice for the first time ever right now. And I actually talked with a firm on my other podcast, RIA Edge. Um, they cater to ultra high net worth individuals. It's a very, very large firm um, with about $20 billion in assets under management. They added a billion dollars through digital marketing last year. Um, and the comment was, you know, ultra high net worth individuals have problems and use Google to solve them too. Right. Um, so it, it's really just you know, to go back to the original you know, discussion around AI, it's you know, evolving so that the way you're connecting with clients looks more like the way they're doing their own research, their own homework, right? And the way they ask questions. Um, so I'm not surprised <laughs> that you're leading with content because you've got a lot of great content and a lot of very important things to say. I'm also not surprised that it's resonating. And I do just have one final question before I let you run. I have to ask, you know, when I start to think about, you know, this marketing or digital marketing funnel that you're creating, um, you know, a lot of what happens next is one thing to engage people through content, another thing to engage them as a prospect. But when you start to bring them on board as a client, right? Historically, onboarding has taken you know, three, four or five days, right? It's a manual process, but that experience has to be better and it has to be built to scale. Um, so how are you seeing right that experience right now when you're bringing new clients in through digital marketing? Are you approaching them any differently? And if you are, what are you doing that's successful? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a very uh, specific and, and I think smart question because when you're building, when you're working with people through digital marketing, you need to build trust with them in, in the beginning of the relationship. And you don't have, let's say that what we're finding out is everyone is, is engaged digitally. This is a time when they need help. This is their concerns. They've had concerns going back to, to um, the, the beginning of COVID. Um, it's been a very fast changing environment and um, they're looking for leadership. And so there's a great opportunity. They're engaged and you, you're able to break geographic boundaries in yes. this environment. Yeah. And so, you know, you could be in New York, like we are, or you can be in uh, across the country. Um, we've had some of our largest clients come in the last couple of years who've been thousands of miles away. And, and so they're willing to, to work with people who are not in their backyard and you're able to connect with them. But you have to, you have to build trust and you have to build trust remotely and you have to build trust with people that, that you, know, you haven't met with face-to-face -face in person. And so I, I think that that's where the digital marketing is and the digital, the digital experience, let me say, is, mm -hmm. is really important yeah. because to build that trust, you need to really show them what it's like to be a client and you need to start solving their problems before they become a client. So if I tell you, this is what, why, you know, here's something about my firm. This is why I'm so great. Uh, you know, that's, that's fine. Uh, you know, you want to show, you know, share, share your firm, your accolades, but what really builds trust is, is solving people's problems. Um, and, and so we spend a lot of time in the beginning of relationships, solving the problems of prospective clients. We're gathering information from them. Um, so we're already onboarding them and treating them as, as clients. So we're gathering, we're having them uh, exposed to our, our digital technology that they will be using as clients. We're gathering their, their um, financial documents. We're giving them planning insights. And what that has allowed us to do is, is better build trust. Um, I, had a, I had a prospect tell me, uh, this is someone who is uh, living in North Carolina. I, as I mentioned, I'm in New York. He said to me, uh, he, came, he came as a digital lead. He said, 
Um, Andrew, what you're what you're telling me about uh, sounds great, but I want you to I want to know that the tax planning opportunities that you have for me are more than going to make up for the fee that you're charging. So so um, that was if I couldn't do that, then he wasn't going to become a client. Right. So what what I did was um, I gathered information um, from him. And I showed him how three simple planning opportunities were going to, the lifetime value of those opportunities was multiples, many, many multiples of the, uh, of the fees that, that we were charging him. And what I've since developed and, and is now available to um, all advisors through FP Alpha is something called the Prospect Accelerator. And what it does is it allows advisors to gather a little bit of information uh, about their uh, about prospective clients, and then it creates health scores, and those health scores are in underplanned areas of uh, like estate planning and tax planning, insurance. Um, you know, we have good tools like risk wise on the investment side, but when it comes to these other areas where there is less competition, it there isn't been there hasn't been anything. So, what what we're doing now with uh, the prospect accelerator is. We're allowing advisors to put it on their website, send it out to prospects ahead of meetings, um, use it in digital marketing, in um, email marketing campaigns. And that information becomes actionable planning opportunities. And it really, it really helps uh, the, the prospect gain that trust uh, that, and, and just accelerate them to, to close. And all that information that you've gathered early on and gotten them used to the digital experience it really allows for a very seamless uh, process to move them on to the service part of this as they become clients, because you, you have, you already have profiles, you have their, their information. That's when they're very engaged with their planning and they have a, they have a need, they have a hot, they have a hot button issue or multiple hot button issues that they want solved. So I think that that, that has been, that's been great both from, a, a closing of, of prospects side of things, as well yeah. as uh, as well as a, an, ef- use, a, an efficient process to uh, to get people started um, at the beginning of the relationship. Yeah, day one is not just about orientation and data collection, right? Um, you're advising them the minute you start working with them, and that example that you just gave around you know, the tax planning that is very common. Right. Um, and I understand why it's a simple question you know, or a simple request. Show me why it's worth you know, the fee that you charge. Um, and, you know, once you can justify it, once you show you do the work, I, I, I think that the way you described it, you're building trust, you know, on day zero. <laughs> um, so um, no surprise that that's something that has helped accelerate not only clothing, closing, but growth for you. Um, so, Andrew, I, I appreciate you taking as much time as you have to not only talk about some sort of big picture macro wealth management issues like AI, uh, like the client experience and digital marketing, but to, for really getting you know, specific and giving some scenarios brings it to life in a way that very few people in the space can. So it was one of the reasons we wanted to have you as one of the very first guests on the next podcast. We appreciate you stopping by and we are very much looking forward to staying in touch. We'll have to, uh, have you back on soon in the next six to 12 months to see how things have been you know, progressing for you on the digital marketing side. But Andrew, thank you so much for joining us here today. I appreciate it. It was great to catch up. Yeah. Great to catch up, Mark. Love to, to do it again. And uh, yeah, looking forward to, uh, to seeing more of that research come out. Yeah. We're looking forward to sharing with everyone and thank you for your contributions. Again, that's Andrew Allfest, the president of Allfest Personal Wealth Management and the founder of FP Alpha. Thank you everybody for stopping by today and listening to the second episode of the next podcast. We hope to see you all very soon on the next episode of the next Wealth Management Firm of the Future podcast. I'm Mark Bruno on behalf of the Wealth Management Team in Informa. See you all soon.